Bold Journey, your television passport to the exciting, colorful world of adventure. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's true journey takes us into the realm of fiction, to the domain of Tarzan, the king of the jungle. In tonight's colorful films, we'll observe Mr. and Mrs. Mickey Carter of Palm Springs, California, in the very heart of Africa, as they film the new Tarzan motion picture for a major Hollywood producer. Prominent in tonight's episode is Tarzan himself, in the person of the handsome young actor, Mr. Gordon Scott. Jungle fire, stampeding herds, leaping lions, ancient rituals, they're all here. It's Cartoon King in Africa, and we'll see the behind-the-scenes story of how Tarzan reaches the movie screens in just a moment. We're now at a very beautiful trailer park overlooking the beautiful Pacific Ocean in Pacific Palisades, California. We're here to meet Mr. Mickey Carter, who brings us the excitement of Africa from his very special trip there with, of all people, Tarzan. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Mr. Carter. Happy to be here. Now, we know that you've spent many, many years in Africa, and much of that time was devoted to bringing Tarzan to the picture screen. So I think that qualifies you to tell us what is it about this cartoon character that makes him live on generation after generation? Well, you know, the comic strips have, and the books have been going on for years and years, and Tarzan is a character that uh, really represents everything in the jungle uh, with kindness and uh, strength and durability and a way of life that we'd all love to live. Well, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Carter, there have been about uh, a half dozen actors portray the title role of Tarzan over the years in pictures. Isn't that correct? No, actually, John, there's been 13 Tarzans. But uh, Gordon Scott, the new Tarzan, uh, he's really wonderful. We had him over there with us this last time, and uh, he really cooperates, and he can do these things uh, right in the jungle. Uh, you'll see him on a two-ton rhino riding on his back. Well, I'll be looking forward to that scene, Mr. Carter, but... Suppose we look at your film now, and we'll have more time to talk later on. Fine, thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, by special film recording, here's Mr. Mickey Carter's description of his behind-the-scenes photography making the new Tarzan motion picture. Yes, John, we headed over the North Pole on the polar flight and down from Europe and into Africa, and our first stop this trip was at Nairobi, where we chartered a little plane and flew on down to Dar es Salaam. And we're all anxious and excited, waiting for the ship coming into the harbor. Uh, this ship carried our cameras and our film in trucks all the way from America over the east coast of Africa. And our jeeps are dropping in out of the ship. And here I picked up my boy David, who's my camera boy. Uh, here's a still picture of David, John. He's in the middle between me and uh, Maisie, our sound man. And he's a Wakamba boy, you know, 16 years old when I got him. And he's really smart now. He can take my lenses apart and put the camera together. And he's quite a boy. Uh, he's been with me, John, on all my expeditions for the last six years. So when the jeeps are ready, we head up into the Serengeti Plains where we're going to meet Tarzan. He's flying in by a little plane up to camp there. We have a rendezvous with him. And of course, we pass my old friends, the baboons. <laughs> you know, they're silly. Uh, one day I stuck my head out of the Jeep and I lost a big chunk of hair. One of them had grabbed my hair and pulled it right out by the roots. The I'm comedians still bald of, up there. The comedians of the jungle. <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, the mothers make good taxi cabs anyway. They do some very funny antics, you know. This is the open belt. We're going to cross way over to that rift valley over there and that's where we're going to set up our camp these are the planes game that we see always here's here's something i've never been able to film in six trips to africa giraffe necking <laughs> there's david my camera boy and uh we're setting up our camp uh getting ready to film some of the shots for the tarzan picture and here's gordon scott coming into camp from his little plane and there's Gordon and myself and Peg, my wife, who did the script work for us, and Gordon reading the script for the Tarzan feature. The next morning, we're on the move, fast, chasing mm -hmm. zebra and wildebeest to get a running dolly shot. 
And to get the best pictures, though, John, we go slow because the animals don't get as frightened and we can get nice close-ups like these eland here. Uh, they're good eating eland, are they? make good chakula. Chakula's food in Swahili, you know. Mm -hmm. And little Tommy's with her windshield wiper tails going. Uh, one day we went right into deep forest and pushed out some buffalo. Pushed them right out into the open so we could film them. Uh, buffalo can be plenty dangerous when they're wounded, but they're curious, you know. They're always coming up at you to look you over. We're getting ready, John, to film Chewy the cat. There, here he comes. Here's a cheetah. Very fast, silent. Chewy and cheetah is the same, I imagine. Yeah, that. well, that means cat in I Swahili, you know. Mm -hmm. And here I'm in a blind. He's coming right into my camera lens. Then we build a blind up above the bait. And with eyes like an eagle, you see, he sees the bait. He gets the scent. Here he comes, right up into my camera. I'm above him, you know. This is a real treat. And he heard the camera here, you see. He's getting the camera. And he snarled at us and jumped down. This is a new twist that I cooked up. Instead of the animals being in the cage, I'm in the cage. And I'm coming right down into a pack of snarling, laughing hyenas. And I dope this idea out because I can get in very close to animals this way and use short lenses. But, you know, there's a big opening in the front of this cage. And one of these hyenas got in front of my lens, so I poked him in the jaw and chased him out of the place. Here's the way we work with lions. Uh, I'm in a pit here, and uh, we're dropping the cage down into this pit. But uh, we have a bait in back of the cage, and for about a day, we tried to inveigle this lion to jump over us, you know, to get right over the camera. By golly, you'll see. Here he comes. Beautiful. Takes a lot of patience to get shots like this. I should say, this is a, a real treat, getting some behind-the-camera stuff here. Here he comes, you see. I'll show you how we work with Tarzan, and just a few Tarzan shots. Here comes Tarzan, swinging in on his famous rope of vines. Now here's a familiar shot. Tarzan's going to climb up that tree and give, that, give his well-known yell. Here's a shot, John, I don't think you'll ever see again because I don't think he'll ever do it again. But, but we got Tarzan right on a big two tons of white rhino. And actually, we're more afraid of the old lady here on the right. She's the one that's a mean one. We have two guns on him, and if she got too cantankerous, we'd have to shoot her. This is, a, you know, the cowboys ride on their horses. Tarzan rides on a rhino. Now we're crossing the river because I'm going to meet an airplane over on the other side, and we're going to look for big herds of game. We'll be in the clouds pretty soon, and I'll show you some terrific herds. John, here we are, high in the clouds over the African belt in a little plain, and we come down over a tremendous herd of black cape buffalo. Excuse me, Mr. Carter, what is this white blur? Well, those are white egrets that live on the buffalo's back, and as we come down closer, we frighten them up into the plain. And you know, it's quite dangerous, too, flying right through all these birds. There's thousands of buffalo here. And even the elephants are on the move because here's a fire on the belt and the fire's chasing all these animals out. It's one of their worst enemies is fire. An impala jumping out to get away from it. Fire on the belt is not uncommon, is it? No, Carter? it's not. It burns for weeks. And we head north to look for a wild tribe called the Topokis. We pass by the Wakamba village, John, that is the home of my camera boy, David Musioko. And this is his village, his home. And his people work hard, and they make the cassava root into food. He played here like these little boys. They're happy, but he could never return to this way of life. And 
most of all the Wakambas love a good dance. They're wonderful dancers. And also gymnasts. Yes, they do these flip-flops and they're really quite agile. David told me that he's tried to help his people, but they just will never change. So apparently David is happier with his lot than... Uh... Well, he is. He could never revert back to this. David speaks nine different languages now, and he's really quite well educated. So we head north and leave the Wakambas, past the giant sables and the tall one eating thorns. You know, I think they have cast iron stomachs. Then we see a silly yard bark. They're always digging, digging, digging. You know, they're anteaters. And then little bush baby looking down at the yard bark. And he's surprised because the yard bark's hit a big rock. He can't go anywhere. The big bird of Africa. Here's one of the strangest things I've ever filmed. It's a zebroid, John. That's a mating between a wild zebra and a horse, a tame horse. And the little baby's only a week old with brown stripes. <laughs> but he doesn't mind. Was there any particular reason for this? Well, the wild zebra came in and mated, but she kicked him out. You know, one zebroid's enough in that family. I'll show you, uh, John, how we work with rhinos sometimes. Uh, of course, we've got two guns on these babies, but, you know, a two tons of rhino can be very peaceful one minute and dynamite the next. And coming in at 12 feet, actually, they could knock you pretty flat if they wanted to. This is all one-inch lens. There's no telephotos here. Oops. Let's get out of here. <laughs> yeah, let's go. The important thing, I imagine, Mr. Carter, is knowing how far you can go. Yes, in knowing their habits. Now, they love a good mud bath, and here we leave old Mama Rhino upside down, and we start heading west over towards Lake Albert. And here we run into something that often happens, a big tree's blown down in a storm during the night. So we hook on our winches, and we have to pull it out of the way. Traveling in Africa, and this trip, we did 20,000 miles all through Africa, and we run into many obstacles like this or little bridges that are washed out. We have to improvise and make our way. So you can see here are tons and tons of log being pulled out of the way with our winches. In spite of the fact that you do have roads, you still have to blaze your own trailer. Yes, times. we do often. While we got a pretty good road here, you'll see as we get on up into the Topoki country, it gets narrower and narrower. In about four days after here, we arrived at Lake Albert. And there we built another ferry with six dugouts to cross the lake. And we built that, John, by putting six or seven dugouts together. You see, we've lashed them together. And we've got our paddlers here, and they're happy and singing because we've given them a lot of dried buffalo meat. They love buffalo and hippo meat and cigarettes. We go along the shore here and disturb the crocs as they're sleeping in the sun. And they don't like it either too much to hear our yelling and crossing. I'm getting a close-up with my big birthday. <laughs> a dentist's nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the river's full of life. Here's a baby awful tired. And I guess Papa's tired of looking at all of us cameramen, too, going by. You know, hippos get excited, and they do crazy things. Here he goes like a submarine. A hippo can tip over a dugout, you know, and chomp a guy right in two. Here's a little kingfisher. And you'll notice with my big berth, I catch him in midair, and he dives like a bullet to get his food. Everything eats in Africa, or is eaten. Elephants are having a nice bath. They love to swim in the water and take their bath. They put on dusting powder to keep them cool. A giant Goliath heron flies off as we pull up to the mouth of the upper Nile.
And we see a very strange thing. Those clouds are not clouds at all, but billions of gnats. What? On the water and fish scooping them up. And hungry pelicans going out to scoop up the fish. We've never seen anything like this, Mr. Carter. It's a strange thing. And a pelican coming in for a skid landing. <laughs> During a little argument here, while we see two hippos kissing and making up, well, my wife, Peg, she's getting a shot of some hippos at close range in a mud hole over nearby. Uh, you'll see here, John, how Tarzan works with the animals in Africa. This little baby chimp is a wild one. We're in the Belgian Congo, and he's trying to move very slowly and cautiously to win over his friendship. And you see how easily he picks him right up and takes him out of our scene here. Oh, that's just wonderful. Here's another take, working with the same little chimp right on the Apula River. And you see the reaction the little chimp gets to him? Gosh, he's a cute fella. Ah, oh, they are. We, we have a lot of fun with chimps. And then we head into the Aturi Forest, across the Belgian Congo, in the rainforest. And our path is getting narrower and narrower, and we have to walk, and we make our way through... A jungle paradise, high in the mountains. It's full of life, weaver birds making their nests. We see baby crested cranes, and the Livingston Toraco, a rare bird, and the giant hornbill. This is the country of the colobus monkey with a sad face. We go on into the Topoki country through deep ferns. And then one day, we meet a very strange tribe, the Sangos, and they port us across slippery rocks and rushing rivers. And we holler at them, Jambo, which means hello in Swahili. But they do not understand. They speak of strange tongue. And they port us, and we see big dugouts with warriors as they pass by from their hunting trips. And they're bringing in a dead hippo that they've speared in the river for food. They love hippo meat. And then we enter the Sango village, a water village built right on the river. And we see strange people that we have never seen before. And little boys fishing. And we hear the jungle music and see a dance put on by the Sangos to welcome us. They beat out on these old crude wooden marimbas. But I like this little four-year-old Toto. Oh, she's cute. And she steals the show. The girls here dance right on the top of shields held high over heads. We leave the Sango village and we're coming in closer and closer each day to the Topokis. And here they are, strange tattooed faces, weird jungle drums and music. And we seek out the chief, Pataki, and through David, who acts as my interpreter, we finally make him understand, and he reenacts a dance, a ceremony that is very strange and very weird. And this was staged specifically for your camera? It was, yes. For four days we lived here and filmed these various shots of these little girls. And in this ritual, why they actually sacrifice a girl, I'm told. They get hopped up and get excited, and their eyes become glassy. Really, sometimes I wonder whether it is being staged. And you'll see here that how they're getting worked up to a fever pitch. They drink a brew made out of palm oil, palm blossoms. And then we saw them bring in the girl on a huge scaffolding, just it's like getting a little do. too realistic. Oh, it is. In fact, these fellas start coming after me with bulging eyes. And this little dwarf was making crazy over the girl. Actually, he was getting very excited. And so, I don't know, it's ham acting, but it's getting a little too real. So I thought I'd better get out of here. I'm but, with you. <laughs> but, John, we've completed all our photography after an eight-month safari. And now we head for home to look at what we've shot.
Well, Mr. Carter, if what you shot is anything like the small portion we saw here, and I'm sure it is, you can be very proud. Oh, thanks, sir. You know what amazes me is the tremendous amount of time and patience that must have gone into the getting of some of these unusual bird and animal shots. Well, some of the things you see, John, for about a half a minute takes us four and five days to get. They're like that cheetah shot. We've got to work on them. They're very tough to get them into our cameras. But they're sure well worth the effort you put oh, into it. Yes, it is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we also have the pleasure of having Mrs. Carter with us. Mrs. Carter, will you come out and say hello, please? How are you? Just fine. We saw you on your husband's film tonight. Do you accompany your husband on all of his trips? Well, I've only been on the last two. You see, we have three daughters, Barbara, Peggy, and Nancy, and 11 grandchildren. And the funny thing was that I never got to go before until this last uh, two times, and he sold the house right out from under me. I had to go. I was free to go then. Well, I can't help admiring your very beautiful, expansive trailer here. Is there a reason for this? Do you, does this make the Carters more flexible, or do you use it on photographic trips around the country? Well, we live in it about four months out of the year, and then, of course, the eight months in Africa, and that's really an ideal way of living. I see. So then when you go off to Africa, you just lock the door and throw away the key. Throw away the key. <laughs> Well, I want to compliment you on your getting so close to that rhino on that shot. Now, that was a very brave thing to do. I'm sure that the women in our audience and, uh, and also the men would be interested in your reactions and emotions at that time. Could you tell them to us, please? We are scared, of course, but uh, we move very slowly. And, of course, we have gun protection always. One good thing you have to remember, move slowly. <laughs> <laughs> well, even though they wouldn't fit me, Mrs. Carter, I wouldn't have wanted to be in your shoes. <laughs> well, Mr. Carter, what was the most dangerous animal you've ever encountered? Well, elephants, John, no doubt about it. They're, they're so powerful and they move so fast. You know, they take about 12, 15 foot steps. Looks like slow motion, but they're really coming. And they can push a bus over, a truck over. If one day my boy climbed a tree and he pushed the whole tree right over. Well, now, either those Topoki natives were the hammiest people I've ever seen or else they were really carried away in that dance. And if they were, I would have been a little frightened. Now. Did you find many cases of superstition among the natives? Oh, yes, they're very superstitious, and they, they take it very seriously. But, Dear, uh, why don't you tell them about the magic circle and the chicken? Yeah. <laughs> well, we've had a lot of fun with their superstitions, nationally. One time I was trying to cook a chicken in a village, you know, and I was sitting on a log, and they start crowding around me. I couldn't hardly breathe, you see, and they start chanting. So I told my interpreter to tell the chief that I was going to draw a magic circle, see? <laughs> and I got up and drew a circle about 50 feet around, and I told them if they crossed that circle, they were going to drop dead. So I <laughs> sat down on my log and cooked my chicken, and they brought their little toes right up to the edge of the line. They wouldn't even cross it. <laughs> well, there must have been many funny experiences among the natives. I guess life wasn't always grim and serious, was it? Oh, we have lots of fun in Africa, even if it's rough going. But <laughs> one of the funniest times, I was up in uh, French Equatorial Africa, and a father missionary invited me over for tea, very formal, you know, and he was so glad to see, uh, see me there. So I went over, and uh, I happened to walk out through his kitchen. I saw his boy was uh, uh, dunking the tea in a sock, in a stocking, <laughs> see, so... I came out and I says, you know, Father, you better uh, go out and see what your boy's doing. So he went out in the kitchen and he was furious, you know. And the boy says, oh, Father, I haven't done anything wrong. It isn't your stocking, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. and Mrs. Carter, we want to compliment you on a most interesting journey. We've enjoyed every minute of it. And personally, I'm looking forward to seeing that new Tars in Motion picture. Goodbye and good luck to both of you. Well, thank you, thank you, John. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are preview scenes from next week's Bold Journey. This is Reverend Ralph C. Cobb of Fresno, California, who ventures into the primitive areas of Nigeria, West Africa, to carry the gospel. This humble preacher captures superb film with his camera, recording for all time not only the charm, but the menace and action of this spectacular land. Roaring felt is followed by torrential rain, bringing the inevitable flood. His plot varies from the duck-billed women to men who shave with an unguarded razor blade. He finds brute power, man's inhumanity to man, and spectacle in the manner of the caliphs of the Arabian Nights. It's inspiration dating back to the days of John the Baptist next week in Preacher in Nigeria.
Gordon Scott, the new Tarzan, will soon be seen in MGM's feature, Tarzan and the Lost Safari, filmed in Technicolor on the locations you have seen in the heart of Africa.